Well, good morning, everybody. If y'all would, let's stand up and worship together this morning. Sing, see the tune. See the tune where he lay. And see the stone rolled away. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. See his hands, see his feet, and touch his cars and believe. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. Oh, and he's alive. Sing this out, he lives. He lives. Shackles breaking free. Hear the song of the redeemed. He is moving, he is moving, he's alive. Take his freedom, take his love. Can you feel it rising up? He is here, he is here, he's alive. Savior, 
Amen. Good to see you this morning. Y'all sound great this morning. You may be seated for just a moment. We want to take this opportunity to welcome you to here to Myrtle Grove Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you've uh, come to worship with us this morning, the King of Heaven, the King of Glory. Uh, you know, Psalm 23, or Psalm 24 tells us this. It says, Who is the King of Glory? David asked that question. It says, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and lift up you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. 
and we worship him today. And again, we're so glad that you've gathered with us here in this place this morning. If you're a guest with us this morning, we're especially glad for your presence here with us today. Again, there's a, a slip on your bulletin there, a tab on your bulletin. If there's any information or any prayer request that you'd like to share with us today, uh, you'd be, uh, turn, fill that out and you can uh, put that in the offering plate when it comes by later on in the service this morning. Just a couple of uh, reminders for us today as well that just after the service, today is Serve Sunday, and our ministry teams will be uh, set up over in the Family Life Center with information about their about their team and the way that they serve. And, of course, we'll have lunch provided. And, and again, uh, the, the best part of it, though, is each, each table will have uh, provided us a, a, some dessert. And hopefully that will draw you to their table to spend some time there and talk about that ministry. And, and nobody will know how many desserts you've had today because you can still have to last three or four tables. But, again, we'll hope you'll decide to join us after the service this morning and hear more about our ministry teams. Also, just want to call your attention to a couple of things. On the back of the bulletin there in our announcement section there, you see our Christian social ministries. Uh, there's a couple of needs there that are indicated. Again, we, we always on Tuesday, you know, have uh, over 100 folks that come through our food pantry and our, our clothing room. And again, I know our, our uh, USDA wasn't wasn't as large as far as what we usually get for a month. So we're here at the end of the month. So we're uh, in need of some canned goods and some things to share with the folks uh, here in the next couple of weeks that come through the food pantry. And also you see there just a need for, for backpacks and some of our, our, our clients that come through the clothing room. Again, they, they pretty much have all their earthly possessions in the back, backpack. And, uh, you know, we try to provide some clothes for them as well. Uh, again, if you, uh, it doesn't have to be used. If you feel led to go out and buy a new one as well, you, I'm sure we'll take that as well. But just if we have those two needs there that I wanted to call attention to this morning. And again, I'm just uh, so glad that you're here today and hope you'll continue now as we worship. Will you stand as we continue to worship this morning? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean We're singing how marvelous Sweet drops of blood for night. 
It's your breath. 
Good morning, church. We're here as a church to praise our Heavenly Father. Let's go to prayer. Our Father, we're here together as a church to give thee praise through sing and to learn of thy word. We also give thanks. And at this time, we wish to return a portion of the blessings we have received. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Rescue me, and who else can rescue me from my feelings? And who else would offer his only son? And who else invites me to call him father?
He is worthy. He is worthy of everything that you can bring and offer to him this morning. Amen. Would you be finding your place in God's word this morning to Genesis chapter 22? Can you turn there with us this morning? We are continuing on in our series entitled His Name is Wonderful. And today we're going to look at Jehovah Jireh. How many of you ever heard that name? Jehovah Jireh. Does anybody know what it means? The, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. So that's what that means. And we talked about how Jehovah is a, another way of translating the covenant name of God, Yahweh, uh, the Tetragrammaton that we've looked at in the, in the Old Testament that literally means I am that I am. That's what Je God's personal covenant name means. And so when you add another uh, characteristic of God to that name, you're describing who Jehovah is. And we've said a lot of things about God so far. And Wednesday night we went through a few more that we couldn't get to here on Sunday morning. We're going to do one of those again this Wednesday night. And then next week we're going to look at Adonai, which is not a construct of Jehovah, but it was always applied right over the top of Jehovah in the Old Testament. And so we're going to talk about what Adonai means next week, so we hope we'll be a part of that. And today we're looking at Jehovah Jireh, as you find your place there in Genesis 22. How many of you know that you never really outgrow tests? Tests. I mean, you think, I, I, this is what I thought. I honestly thought that whenever I was in grade school, I was counting down the years to the point where I'd never have to take a test ever again. And then God called me to seminary. <laughs> and man, is that place full of tests. Gosh, man, test after test. You know, they give these little blue book. Y'all know what a blue book is? Any of you went to college, you know what blue books are? No, okay. All right, y'all don't know that. Maybe they only do that in seminary. Chris, they only do that in seminary? Uh, a blue book. They basically give you a blue book, and the blue book is a, a book of just blank pages. It's, it's kind of thin. It's not real thick. But they expect you to take that blue book and put something on every page to demonstrate what you know. So, so even whenever I got to college and then seminary, I was still taking tests. And then even after that, we still run into tests all the time. We have physical tests, right? I was over at the hospital visiting with a patient, and she had to take a breathing test. You breathe in there, that incentives barometer. You remember that? You just, they, and then they measure how good you're doing. Um, and then, you ever had to do a CT scan or blood test? Or anybody had to go through physical tests like at the hospital? Then there's emotional tests that we go through. Right? Just having children is an emotional test. And then we go through spiritual tests. And in all of these tests, we find out that we are called to trust in the Lord in those spiritual tests, to trust that He will provide. Because when spiritual tests come upon us, what we're finding out is the Lord is teaching us. He's our teacher, and He has truth that He wants us to learn about Himself. And what He's teaching us is that He is all-sufficient, and how we pass the test determines or is determined by how much we trust Him. I mean, it's a faith test. That's what spiritual tests are. And tests are a part of the school of life. And they're part of our walk with Christ. And when they come upon us, we should recognize that the Lord is building within us the character of Christ. And we are learning to love Him and trust Him more. But see, the problem is, in the middle of the test, we get test anxiety. I remember when I used to take tests, and I'd look at that clock, and I'd just watch the time passing, and we're supposed to be timed, and it was a standardized test, and, and then you get to the end, the last second there, and you see a lot of bubbles that aren't filled in. You go and scribble in all in the bubbles and all that, and then finally the teacher says, stop, what? Put your pencil down. 
So the test anxiety that we have whenever it comes to our spiritual tests, really, what generates that anxiety? Well, it's the revelation of the fact that there's an area within us or within our lives that we're not fully trusting Jehovah. And we haven't fully come to realize He is Jehovah Jireh in that particular area of our life. And so He takes us through that test so that the eventual outcome is that on the back end of that test we'll be saying, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord is my provider. Okay, So let's stand together and let's read about Abraham's test. And how he learned that the Lord is Jehovah Jireh. This is the only time that this name occurs in all of Scripture. Yet we make so much of it. Why? Because this story is such a powerful, amazing story. I mean, it just, it just tears my heart to pieces every time I read this story. We're not, not going to read all of it yet. We'll get to it. So let's just read the first few verses, okay? After these things... God tested Abraham. Unfortunately, Abraham, see, he didn't have that line in Scripture written for him. Scripture was yet to be recorded. So he didn't know that this was a test. We do, but he didn't. God said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Wow. In verse 3, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Well, let's stop there and pray together. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, we can, we can feel the heaviness that Abraham must have felt as he was carrying this burden, this weight that you had placed upon him. And he was carrying it all the way up to the mountain. But Lord, thank you for the example that we have of faith and trust and total devotion to you that led Abraham to pass the greatest test of his life and taught us that you are Jehovah Jireh. The God that Abraham met on that mountain is the same God who provides life and breath, healing, salvation, eternal life each and every one of those of us who trust you as the provider, the Savior, the one who provided his one and only Son for us. If there's one today, Lord, that is struggling with the test, a test of faith, one of life's tests, I pray, Lord, that they would put their trust in you right here and right now. And Lord, if there's one here today that's never trusted you for the very first time, I pray that, Lord, today they would trust in you and be saved and have their name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I pray that you accomplish much right now in our hearing and that we'll hear the testimony of faith from the lips of those who have trusted you as Jehovah Jireh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And there was a time in Abraham's life where he would have never passed this test. Abraham is going to go through this valley of testing because 
he was walking with God. Don't miss that. Don't get that wrong. Because Abraham was not being tested because he was being unfaithful to God. Abraham was being tested because he was demonstrating faith in God. And God wanted that faith to grow. Now, you need to make sure that you write that down and you get that clear. Abraham was tested because he was walking with God. And some of us, we think that God's angry at us whenever we go through the test. How many of you believed your teachers were angry at you whenever they gave you a test? I knew some angry teachers growing up. And that we, they knew that we hadn't read the assignment. And so they came in with a chip on their shoulder. And as soon as everyone took their seats, the bell rang. The teacher would say, clear your desks, take out a sheet of paper, and I'm going to give you the hardest questions I could possibly give you. They didn't say it that way, but that's the way it felt. They were just angry. God's not an angry teacher. God's not vindictive. The reason God gives us tests is so that we may prove our faith in Him. And He doesn't need us to prove our faith in Him to Himself. He wants it to be proven to ourselves and others around us as well. Now what Abraham is going to learn about God is that the God on the mountain is still the God in the valley. Abraham had been on several mountains with God. Abraham had seen great victories in his life. Abraham had experienced the presence of God like none of us have ever experienced God here on this earth. God had spoken to Abraham, had called him out, Told him, hey, leave this place and go to that place. And that's exactly what God does. He says, go to the mountain, rise uh, and go to the mountains, of which I shall tell you, he says. How many of you know that God had already said that to Abraham at one point? God woke Abraham up one day in the land of his father, and he said, go in that direction, and I'll show you where we're going when we get there. So Abraham had to walk by faith to a land he'd never known. Abraham had walked with God in many places. But now Abraham was going to enter into the deepest valley that he'd ever been in. Spiritually and literally as well. Did you know that where Abraham was in the last chapter is one of the lowest places on earth? The Bible tells us that he names that place where he is Beersheba. And I did a little bit of study and I I found out that Beersheba is only elevated to 800 feet above sea level. Okay? If you go a little bit further down to the Dead Sea, right down from Beersheba, probably close to where Abraham is going to be walking for the next three days, that is the absolute lowest place on this earth. Now you contrast that with where Abraham is going. Abraham is on one of the lowest places on earth and he's going to another place that's one of the highest places in Israel. Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, is over 12,000 feet elevated above sea level. So there's 11,200 feet of elevation difference from where Abraham is to where he's going. But you know, spiritually, Abraham's in a a low place. I I don't want you to see, don't, don't do this. Don't make Abraham out to be some kind of hypnotized robot. That when God said, offer your one and only son, the son whom you love, on as a burnt offering to Abraham, said, sure God, no problem. All in a day's work, walking with God. No. Abraham entered into a spiritual crisis at that moment. Now, one of the worst things that we do as Christians, when another believer is going through one of the hardest times of their lives and we walk up to them and say, well, just have faith. Or maybe even we go so low as to criticize them for doubting. Can I tell you, whenever when someone is going through a, a struggle, trusting and obeying Christ, in their moment of testing, they need encouragement, not discouragement. 
Don't belittle them because they're in a bad place. Don't denigrate them for doubting. Don't criticize them for their confusion. Sometimes you can't even imagine the weight that another brother or sister in Christ is bearing in their moment of trial. You know, David went through some of these same valleys that Abraham would have gone through. In fact, the, the, the valley Kidron was a deep, dark valley. In fact, it's, it's been said that the light of the temple shed light over the entire city of Jerusalem except for the valley that was between Mount Moriah and the Mount of Olives. And it was one of the deepest, darkest places for David because there was a night whenever Absalom, his son, was trying to kill him, he had to leave flee in the middle of the night with just his children. He didn't even have time to get a cloak or get his shoes on. He grabbed the children up, his wives and everything that he had. He got up and he ran. Second Samuel fifteen thirty. It says, but David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives. Okay, so he's down in the valley in the lowest place and he's about to go up the Mount of Olives. And this is how the Bible describes that ascent. He went up weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and they went up weeping as they went. You know, for some of you this morning, it was a painful, painful thing to get up and show up to church. It was one of the hardest things for you to do, to be here today. And I want to tell you something. The Lord sympathizes. And He loves you right where you are, no matter what it is that you're facing. Whatever burden you're bearing as you come to this place, He loves you. And He is still Jehovah Jireh. And what He is calling you to do right now is simply to trust Him and obey Him. And let me encourage you. There are faithful brothers and sisters who will cover their heads along with you and weep along with you and pray for you and carry you through. And what you need to hear right now is that the Lord that's on the mountain where you're headed... He's still the Lord in the valley. And when you come down off the mountaintop and you go back down into the valley, He'll still be the Lord of the mountain. Jehovah, Yahweh, can be trusted with whatever you're dealing with. Can I tell you that He can be trusted with whatever you hold most valuable in your life. I mean, Abraham had been promised a son. God said he would give him this son. And that through Abraham's descendants, this son, this Isaac, this one that he promised, that all the nations would be blessed. And God had never changed. Not for one moment, there is no shadow due to his changing his mind or his turning. Yet Abraham needed to trust him and obey him with something that seemed contradictory to that promise. Matthew 19. Peter is struggling with the same idea. Peter is saying, listen, I feel like everything I do with you, Jesus, is just losing. I'm losing all the time. And Peter said in reply to Jesus' statement, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you have followed Me, will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, now this is the part you need to listen to, everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for My sake, My name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. For some of you to say, the Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh this morning, it feels like, well, right now I feel like I'm losing. 
I feel like he's not providing. But listen to that promise. We'll receive a hundredfold. And we'll inherit eternal life. It's not because you've lost something that He gives you eternal life and inheritance in heaven. It's not because you did anything to earn it. It's not because Peter had done something that was worthy of heaven. It was the reality that God is provider. That God is faithful. And that's why we will have so much in heaven. Things that we can't even imagine. Things that we've never even seen before, the Bible says. We'll have it in heaven. But it's not because you earned it. It's not because I earned it. It's because God is faithful. And He is Jehovah Jireh. So here's a thought. If there's anything in your life, I want you to consider this. If there's anything in your life, your house, your car, your family, your time, your talent, your treasure, that you are unwilling to give to Jesus right now, if He asked you to give it, then you have not fully trusted Him. So is there anything that you would say, I need to hold on to that? If that's true, then that means that you've never fully understood that He is Jehovah Jireh. He's the God who provides. In the valley, trust and obey. Secondly, though, on the way up, follow through. On the way up, follow through. Now look at verse 4, and let's pick it up here and pick the story up again. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. So how many days was Abraham having to walk through the valley before he saw the mountain? He was there three days traveling from Beersheba up to Mount Moriah. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself. The lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Once again, God sent Abraham in a direction and told him, I'll show you when we get there. It took him three days to see the mountain. When he finally saw the mountain, he's standing at the base of the mountain, about to go up. It's a steep climb. We have to leave the donkey here. The servants are going to stay here. But Abraham is going to take Isaac, his son, the implements of worship along with him so that he may offer his offering on that mountain. In sports, you know that the follow-through is almost as important as how you start. Right? I mean... If you line up your shot perfectly, but you don't follow through, you might shoot a brick. The punter who doesn't follow through won't get enough air on the ball to land his punt. The baseball batter who doesn't follow through, I mean, mean, you can get your stance just right, you can load up just right, you can turn just right, But if you don't follow through, you're going to hit pop-ups all day long. Spiritually, when we don't follow through with our commitment that we've made to the Lord, we rob ourselves of the manifest power of God in our lives. There's three ways that Abraham followed through. First, Abraham declared his intention. He said, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Abraham declared to those around him that his intention was to follow through. 
Now these guys, they've seen Abraham go up the mountain many times and offer his offering, his burnt offering on the altar. They've watched him do that. The servants knew that something was missing. I mean, here's Isaac. We don't know exactly how old Isaac was. Some people said he couldn't have been a teenager yet because that wouldn't be much of a sacrifice. But I, I think that's kind of kind of rude. I love my teenager, um, and I would I would never offer him up that way. <laughs> we don't know how old he is, but he's old enough to start thinking. Hey, there's something missing here. The servants are thinking, hey, something's missing here. And they could have said to Abraham, Abraham, hey, what you doing, man? We're, something's not working out. What are you about to do? Abraham says, we're going up to worship. I and the boy are going up to worship, he says, and we will come back. Now, that's a declaration of faith, isn't it? The second thing is Abraham determined to go up. Abraham took the wood of the offering, the fire and the knife and his son. And the Bible says twice. So so they went, both of them together. Some of us, we come right to the cusp of what it is that God wants us to do. And then we back right back down. And we shrink away from what God has told us to do. Oh, I can't go on a mission trip. I I just don't like to fly on airplanes. I don't like to travel. I mean, I literally had this issue. Whenever I, at another church, I won't tell you which one, but another church, we tried to plan a mission trip. And I tried to sit there with the list of people, you know, that I wanted to go and all that. And I, one by one, I began to ask them to go on the mission trip with us. And one by one, and probably five out of ten people replied this way, Oh, um, uh, I just really have trouble sleeping in another bed beside my, besides my bed. Or I have, I have bowel issues and I just can't go anywhere else besides my house. And those things like that. I said, well, God's calling us to go. Let's go. I have people say, well, I'm just not smart. I don't know enough of the Bible to be teaching. And I say, we need teachers for Sunday school. We need teachers for our children. We need teachers for our youth. I just don't know God's Word. Enough. Well, why not? Dig into God's Word. Oh, I can't witness because I just don't know how. Have you met Jesus? The, the, the only qualification to be a witness for Jesus is knowing Him. That's it. Why can't you talk about somebody you know? You talk about other people. I hear you. Why can't you talk about Jesus? See, we come right up to the edge of what God wants us to do. We're right there at the base of the mountain. The mountain is there. We've committed in our hearts that we would do it. And then we get there and we say, "Ah, I just don't know about that. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I didn't hear God. One of the greatest things that qualified Abraham and prepared him to pass the test is at the very beginning of the text, we hear God say, Abraham, call him by name. Abraham was listening to God. He heard the call. He heard the command. And he responded. Then, what was his response? God says, Abraham, Abraham heard. And then he says, here I am. What does that mean? I'm available. And in other words, it's God, whatever you want. How many of you have matured in your walk with Christ to the point, you don't have to raise your hand, where you'd say, God, when you call my name, whatever it is, whatever it is, I've matured in my relationship that way with Allison. When I hear her say, Josh, I know I'm about to get instructions. And I say, yes, ma'am. Sometimes. Abraham determined that he was going to go up. When he made that commitment and he said, here I am, what Abraham meant was, I'll go whatever it was, 30 miles from Beersheba to Jerusalem. I'll go up the mountain, that 
thousand feet. I'll go up the mountain and I will follow through God even to the point of raising the knife and following through. I will follow through with what you've told me to do. But Abraham also demonstrated confidence in his God's provision. What did he say to his son? The Lord will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. Can I tell you something right now? And I've said this before, but I want to say it loud and clear. The Lord God provides everything you need to complete what he has commanded you to do. In other words, you have everything you need to obey God. You've got it. So what does that mean? It means my excuses are just that. They're just an excuse. Somebody said excuses are like armpits. Everybody has two and they both stink. God's not listening to your excuses this morning of why you're not obeying Him. I'm going to say that again. Jehovah Jireh is not listening to the reasons why you have given that you are disobedient to Him. He's done with your excuses. And it's time for you to follow through in your obedience. Many people take their commit, make their commitment to the Lord, but instead of following through, following through they lack power. And because they lack power, they lack conviction. And because they lack conviction, they lack conversions. And because they lack conversions, the church lacks conversions, we stagnate. And spiritual apathy begins to set in. And we need a revival. We need a coming back to God, a turning back to God. And where does it start? It starts whenever we say, I will follow through with the commitment that I have made. To my Lord. I will surrender it all to Him right here and right now. Now here's the thing. Abraham did not know whether he would come down from the mountain with his son or not and how that would happen. But he did know that Jehovah was provider. He knew that. And for Abraham, that was enough. And listen, the confidence that he has in Jehovah as, as Jireh is that God had said, God had said, I will bless you. And not only had God said, I will bless you, God had proven it over and over in Abraham's life. And isn't that true for you and me? He's proven it. And so on the way up, Follow through, but lastly, when you're on the mountain, offer your praise. Offer your praise to Him. Can I tell you something? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the world around us. God has never been broke a day in His life. I've been broke a few times. I mean, I've been the one that's gone to that ATM machine punching the, the balance inquiry button on there just to see how many dollars I had left before I went and bought something. I don't know if any of you have ever been there before. I've been broke. Broke, broke. It's all my fault. I spent too much money on stuff I didn't need to impress people I don't like. That's what Dave Ramsey says. That's the reason I'm broke. God's never been broke. He's never lacked anything. I mean, did it, somehow did it bring, would it have brought God pleasure in receiving Isaac as a burnt offering? So, come on, church. Somebody say no. No. It wasn't about that. It was a test. God, I mean, He is, Jehovah Jireh is the breath in my lungs. He's the food on my table. He's the roof over my head. 
The sun rises and sets at his command. He doesn't need anything that I can give him. He doesn't need me to be here right now. He'd be doing just fine without me. The problem is I need him. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord. This, and uh, Brother Chris made reference to this passage. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. See, God is the one that put the world together. Jehovah Jireh, the provider, he's the one that gave us everything that we have. In our devotions that we've been doing with our family, I, I, I got Louis Giglio's book, it's uh, How Great Is Our God. I love it so far. highly recommend it to any of the parents or grandparents out there to read with their family, but it just talks about how the, the earth is just perfectly positioned so far away from the sun. And that the, the moon uh, operates gravitational pull upon the earth in such a way to cause the tides, and the tides cause the weather. And so everything that, that happens is just finely tuned together so that we can exist here upon this earth. If it weren't so, human beings couldn't live on this planet. And the chances of there being another planet like our planet where human beings could live on it in the world is just an astronomical figure that that could exist somewhere else in the universe. God did this to prove to every one of us that He is Jehovah Jireh. Did you forget that He made you? I don't, I don't know what it is you're facing right now. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what trial, what test you're facing right now. But do not forget that He's the one that made you. And not only does He make us, but the Bible says that the Creator of the universe did not spare His only Son. And so here's what Paul says that he says, he who, did, he, did, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So here's Abraham on the mountain. And they came to the place which God had told him. Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. We call that, by the way, substitutionary sacrifice. In verse 14, so Abraham called the name of that place, what? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Yes, praise God. What's so interesting about this is this incident occurred on the exact same place that the Temple Mount would be later constructed. David, David made sure that he purchased the threshing floor of Orna which was seated right on top of Mount Moriah. And so right there where the ram was caught in the thicket was the same place where the substitutionary sacrifices of the people of Israel were offered up to the Lord year after year after year on the Day of Atonement. The, the animals were killed and one was sent away into the wilderness. And on the day that Jesus was condemned to death, Barabbas was sent away. Jesus was led out 
on a small hill that sits opposite of Mount Moriah, right there in the same place probably where the ram was caught in the thicket, Jesus took upon himself the crown of thorns, stretched his arms out wide, took the nails in his hands and his feet, and he shed his innocent blood in your place and in my place. And there the Lord provided a way for us, you and me, to have eternal life. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through him, this is our admonition. This is what Abraham did. This is what we should do. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice. Not, not a burnt offering. A sacrifice of what? Of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. Do you acknowledge that he is Jehovah Jireh? Offer up your praise to Him. Give Him glory for what He's done. Thank God that He is provider. Not just that He gives you life and breath in your lungs, but He has promised eternal life through the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. And do it continually, He says. Over and over. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. Maybe, maybe you came here this morning thinking that you are bringing your sacrifice to the Lord. You are bringing your offering to the Lord. And that now that you're here, the Lord will be pleased. Can I tell you something? When you enter into His presence, you find out that He has done everything for you already. He's provided everything for you. And there is nothing that you can give Him that He needs but what He wants, what He desires, is your heart of devotion and praise. Have you offered that to Him this morning? And maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, I, I realize my need for Him right now. I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I'm separated from Him. And if He's revealed that to you in your heart and you're ready to trust Him, just pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and I deserve to be separated from You. But Jesus, I believe that You died in my place. That You are the provision of God for me to be saved. And to have eternal life. So Jesus I. Confess my sin. I put my faith and my trust in you. Save me a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. And make me a new person. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying. And being raised again. To save me. Now I'll spend the rest of my life living for you. And I pray it in your name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're about to have our invitation. And in this invitation, it's the opportunity for you to declare publicly what you've just prayed privately. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, this is your opportunity to say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jehovah Jireh, the provider. And if you believe in him, You've trusted Him for the very first time this morning. That's something that's not meant to be kept secret. It's meant to be something that's declared publicly. And so you come. This is your invitation. If you're here this morning and you need prayer, you're just going through that valley and you want someone to come alongside you and offer you comfort and, and share words of comfort with you and lift you up to the throne of grace, our prayer counselors will be here to do that with you. So you come. And if you'd rather just grab someone near you and say, hey, I need you to pray for me, I'm sure that someone will pray with you and for you. And if you're here today and you know that God has called you to Myrtle Grove Baptist Church, that this is your home, this is the place where God wants you to serve along the saints and worship Him, then you come. And we'll receive you gladly into the family of faith. Let's sing together.
go ahead and bow your head for a moment. And let's just stay in, in a reverent disposition. And God's put it on my heart and I know that certain areas in our lives where God is saying I desire obedience right here and I'm not hearing the excuses anymore. 
but why not? I've given you everything that you need to obey me. Do you trust him? Him? You said you trust him. You said you trust him. How about the follow through? Where is it? You know, we follow Jesus one step of obedience at a time. He doesn't always show us what's on the other side of the mountain. He just says, take one step at a time in obedience to me. Father, we are grateful. We hear your calling. Here we are. Whatever your will, may it be done in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Drew. I don't have 50,000 announcements for you this time, so that's good. Um, but I do want to remind you of Serve Sunday just over there in the FLC. We're going to have some sandwiches for you and then a ton of desserts. Um, we can't do church without volunteers. We can't do church without all the many of you that serve hour and hour and hour and give up your Sunday school and give up your worship hour and give up your own time because of y'all that are already serving. Now, I say that. As a challenge, if you're not in a spot of serving yet, we could use you. And, and I promise you the benefit and the blessing that overflows from your service, you can't put a price on. Um, worship, yes, is absolutely incredible. I don't like missing worship. But I also get so full of joy when I get to serve God's people. So don't miss out on that returned blessing that you will get. By serving. So come over to Serve Sunday, grab you a sandwich, and then come check out all of the places that you can get plugged into. That being said, I'm going to bless the food, and we will get on over there. Father, we thank you again for just the opportunity to come into your house, into your church, and to worship your name. God, I pray that um, as as we go throughout our week, that we remember your name, Jehovah Jireh. God, that that, that that will just overflow out of us. That we will give you all of our praise, all of our glory, every breath that we have, God, it's yours to begin with. And I pray that we give it back to you with singing your praise and leading others to know the truth of what your son did on the cross for us. God, I pray that you bless the food that we're about to have and bless those that are already volunteering and those that will soon be volunteering. God, put a burden on their hearts. If it is your will that they, that they serve, God, show them how it is that they serve, how often and where. Father, we love you. In your heavenly name, amen.